Hey everybody, welcome to a panel discussion for Spirit Aviation Week. I am Kyle Ludwig on the EAA staff, and today we're talking fun and affordable flying with the Vintage Aircraft Association. About two years ago, the association set on a quest to highlight these fun and affordable airplanes. Relatively low cost of operation, low maintenance cost, low fuel burn, and insurance cheaper than your car's policy make these airplanes uh, fun and affordable and desirable to own and operate. Uh, names like Luscombs, Taylor Crafts, Piper Cubs, Arancas, and single engine Cessnas all fall into the category. And tonight, we have four panelists to join us to talk about their uh, quest for fun and affordable airplanes and the airplanes they own. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the show Lynn Dawson, Jacob Palmer, Ray Johnson, and John Hoffman. Guys, welcome to the show tonight. How you doing? Hey, Kyle. Good. Thank you. Good. Very good. Well, without uh, waiting off any further, Lynn, let's talk about your airplane first. You own a gorgeous Cessna 172. And uh, how long have you owned your airplane? Well, this is actually the second 172 I've owned. The first one I bought while I was a student. It was in 1956. It was very affordable, um, comparable, you know, to what I was paying to rent. And uh, once I got my license, I looked for something maybe they had a little bit better panel than this one did and uh so i bought this in 2001 and then i sold my first cessna to my sister who was working on her license time <laughs> so um i've had it for quite some time when i bought it the paint was pretty plain the um you know it 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 was very affordable i don't think i paid much more than i did for the first one that i had and uh, I've done a few things to it, like have it have it painted and had to have the engine overhauled. But the overall cost to operate the plane is very inexpensive. Uh, annuals are pretty routine. And of course, the Cessna, they built so many and there's so many O300s out there that you can still buy new parts for the engines and uh, if anything were to go wrong. So, uh, and Sure. I always want to mention the insurance. I think people are shocked how low, uh, low the cost of insurance is. Insurance on airplanes like these are absolutely, you know, absolutely cheap policies compared to automobiles that we all own. And, you know, I think it's fun to That's note right. that the 172 was the most flown airplane during COVID, even more so than the Boeing 737, which normally holds those reins. So uh, another fun fact for everybody. I want to switch gears a little bit to another iconic airplane. If if the viewers don't know what a Cessna 172 is or didn't know before Lynn spoke, they definitely probably know what a Piper Cub is. Uh, John Hoffman's with us from the Cub Club. A lot of Piper Cubs down at the Hartford Airport uh, in Hartford, Wisconsin. And uh, John, how long have you been uh, associated with Piper Cubs? Uh, with Piper Cubs, uh, probably since 2007. I'm one of Steve Krug's retreads. Um, I always was uh, uh, in maintenance. And uh, one of those who got his uh, pilot's license when he was 18, and then life got in the way. And there were 21 years between logbook entries. So... My wife said, you've known Steve for years. He's been trying to get you back in the air. Go see him and get your, you know, getting a cop. I'm like, so, all right. So that was about 2007. And in 2008, my wife, again, this is the, not the practice wife, but the best wife ever. Um, <laughs> she, she said, hey, we got enough money. Why don't you go buy a cub? So uh, in 2008, I, I bought my cub and I've, I've had it since then. And uh, I took over the cub club reigns in 2015 so i'm also on ia and uh, amp now how many cubs do you take care of on an annual basis john oh gosh probably regularly about 10 that uh, and then i have i have uh, the odd wells that come in once in a while just to have maybe a brake conversion or stuff like that so i i take care of quite a few uh, uh cubs um they're pretty straightforward um, they're probably, because of their iconic nature, they're probably not the the most affordable of the of the uh, fun and affordable aircraft, and they're they're completely useless except for having absolute joy, you know. And uh, I can hear them right now. We've got three in the pattern uh, doing touch and goes as uh, as we do this, so and we're, we're having a blast. Cubs are built for fun and affordable flying only. They're not traveling machines. 
Uh, but they've served their purpose, you know, since the forties, they're tremendous airplanes. Um, what, what would you say your favorite part is about owning and, and, you know, operating cubs? Um, there's nothing more enjoyable about, uh, taking somebody up for a flight at about eight o'clock at night on a day like tonight, that's, you know, it's 80 degrees, the doors are open, the windows up and you just, you know, you get at cub height, which is about, you know, 500 feet and just tool around the countryside and wave at the people. And it, there is nothing more than seeing, uh, the joy on somebody's face that has never, never been in that position. And, you know, the Wisconsin countryside is great for cub flying. Well, John, thanks for being with us. I, I want to switch over to the youngest panelist tonight, Jacob Palmer. Uh, he owns a gorgeous Aranka Chief. And uh, Jacob, tell us how you acquired that airplane. Uh, well, in, uh, it's a pretty funny story. I went to uh, um, high school on Flay Bob Airport, which most of you probably know is home to EAA Chapter 1. And... Uh, uh, every day after school, I would just, you know, total up and going down the flight line and look at all the cool and vintage airplanes along the line because Bob definitely has a history of a, a lot of vintage aircraft. And um, one day I just, you know, noticed this old funky looking airplane. I had no idea what it was. And, you know, it wasn't white and it stood out in the rest because it was yellow. And, and uh, I walked up to it and saw that it had a sign that said for sale or, or trade. And uh, immediately, you know, I was a sophomore in high school and I didn't have the money for an airplane <laughs> and I, you know, didn't have a license. And so I called up my dad, which uh, he wasn't, a, he's not a pilot either. So we had never experienced seeing an airplane or know what the, you know, methods are in purchasing an airplane. So we called the guy and uh, he, he was very interested in taking a trade, but for only specific things. And so my mom at the time was just not on board with the flying. And so my dad and I came up with a scheme to, because he had a Harley at the time. If we get rid of the Harley, maybe B mom will be okay with an airplane. And uh, she, after some convincing and you know struggles with trying to convince her to do it, we figured we finally got her to say yes. And so we contacted the guy, and he really didn't have any interest in motorcycles. And so it kind of dropped off for a couple months, and then we finally got a phone call. And he goes, you still interested in my, my little Aranka? And he jumped on right away. Yes, yes. He goes, I got a guy that wants the Harley, and he'll pay me cash for the Harley. And uh, right there, you know, we got into the fun and affordable aircraft. Uh, the airplane was pretty rough. Yeah, the paint was in, the paint was pretty bad. Um, you know, so we put it in the hangar for a couple of years and just you know gave it some love and uh, put a fresh coat of paint on the fabric. And uh, I got my license through the school. Once I graduated, I flew the wings off that thing. Um, and it, it's been a, such a fun plane to fly. Now, Jacob, how many hours have you put on? Oh, I have probably put near 700 hours on it. I put about um, 200 hours on it before I uh, rebuilt it. Um, I flew it until the fabric could not stay on it any longer. And uh, so we had to pull it apart. And, you know, the intent was to do just a uh, a fabric job on it. But it, well, once we opened the fabric, it turned into quite a bit more. But still, it, um, you know, it, after restoring it, you know, I still spent far less than what I would spend on a newer aircraft. And, you know, I feel like it's a new aircraft to me. It's just a beautiful, wonderful plane to take around. And, you know, just like you're saying about with the Cubs, you know, nothing like it going low and slow and, you know, coming in on final at 65, you know, and really having the windows open, your arm hanging out. And you can't beat it. And it's, it's what's awesome. I tell people that don't really understand the aviation. It's kind of like driving around in an old Mustang or something you know, with the top down. It's awesome. And, and all of these restorations start is exactly what you said, right? Oh, we're just going to recover the airplane. And then they turn into so much more. Uh, and I think exactly. that's how every award-winning airplane at Oshkosh starts out as well, right? We all say, hey, like Lynn's airplane, it needed a fresh fresh coat of paint. But then it turns into a panel and paint and, and a full right. restoration. And that's what is fun uh, with all these airplanes. You know, there's probably a lot of young pilots watching the panel today, uh, Jacob, because, you know, like us, they see fun and affordable in the title. And they say, hey, we're interested in that, too. If you had mm -hmm. any advice for the young people watching today on buying their own airplane, you know, what, what would that advice be? 
Oh boy. Um, definitely, you know, look, you know, be careful when you're buying an airplane, make sure you're buying something that's good. But, and I got lucky and fortunate that, you know, the plane was in pretty dang good shape, you know, very low time. Um, but with a lot of these old airplanes, they're, they, they've been loved. Uh, you know, they're still flying today. You're going to get a pretty dang good airplane. And even if you have to put some time into it, it's worth it. You know, the airplane better. I know every nut and bolt on my plane. And I like that because I know, you know, if anything were to happen, I know everything about it. I, I assist the owner, I assist the mechanic with the annuals. And so definitely, you know, look more towards those vintage aircraft and, and ask questions and, and, uh, you know, really know what you're buying. Well, Jacob, thanks for being with us tonight. Yeah. So last but not least on the panel, you might have seen him before at Vintage and Review at Air Venture, or maybe at his uh, flying cruise in in Marion, Indiana. Ray Johnson, thanks for being on the panel tonight. Uh, thank you, Kyle. It's good to be here. Great. Now, you own two gorgeous vintage airplanes, Ray, an award-winning chief uh, that's normally parked in front of the Red Barn during Air Venture, and also a vintage booting. First, the chief. How long have you owned that airplane? Since, since the fall of 1979. Uh, we bought the airplane uh, thinking that we were going to have to rebuild it, ended up flying it about seven years and uh, just flew the wheels off of it, got my license in it, uh, took most of my flight training, almost all of it in it, and um, still own the same airplane today. That is fantastic. Uh, if you were to take a guess, how many hours have you put on your, your chief, you know, over the decades? Well, it's... I've got at least at least at least twenty five hundred hours on that very airplane that I've flown flown it, um, and it's just been a joy. Um, we've rebuilt it twice, um, flew it for years with a sixty five horsepower engine, and um, when we rebuilt it, our focus was totally original. Now, since I've gotten older, uh, we put a Bill Pancake STC on it. Uh, it's got an 85 stroker engine with a lightweight electric starter. Now we don't have a uh, electrical system, but we do have a battery and we just put a tender on it and uh, makes it nice. Now that I'm a little older, don't have to get out and prop it. So That's fantastic. Now to your other airplane, Ray, also kind of a family piece, uh, your Mooney. Tell us when you got that airplane and how you acquired it. It's kind of a neat story. Well, we've owned this airplane about 10 years. It's a 1963 Mooney M20C, perhaps one of the most economical retractable airplanes you can get because it has the Johnson bar. It's a manual um, gear up and down, uh, cruises at 140 knots at about 10 gallons an hour, uh, likes 5,500, 6,500 feet. Um, we fly strictly VFR this airplane doesn't have a lot of uh, nice things on it. It's it's strictly manual. We don't have an autopilot. We do have ABSB. Uh, we fly it to Jackson, Michigan, quite a bit. That's where my wife's family. But it's uh, if we want to get out and take a little ride, uh, it really goes. And now I have to put you on the spot, Ray. Between your chief and the Mooney, which one are you going to fly in and for what mission? What's your favorite? Well. I do love them both, but I'll tell you, the old chief is going to be in my estate, Kyle. <laughs> it's uh, it's just a, a low and slow, wonderful airplane to fly. Uh, it's wonderful to take somebody a ride, uh, just like John was saying, go out about eight o'clock at night and take a ride locally. So um, someday if I have to get rid of an airplane, probably the Mooney will go, but the old chief's gonna stick around. You know, the bonus of these old airplanes uh, Kyle, is that they're also sport pilot. And uh, that's a real nice feature. You know, it allows a lot of people to get back into flying that couldn't for a while. Absolutely. You, you hit a wonderful point. Uh, in 2004, when sport pilot came out, it really made the marketplace for these airplanes solid and they're super sought after. So let's switch gears a bit. And I want to focus on everybody's area expertise. So, John, you've been a mechanic on these airplanes for decades. Uh, why are the fun and affordable category airplanes, whether they're a fabric covered chief champ or cub, 
or maybe a, a all metal airplane, a Cessna 120, 140, or a, a Luscom, a later model Luscom. Why are they so cheap to operate? And and tell the folks watching today, you know, why they should be interested in that when looking at these airplanes. Yeah, um, a lot of them are powered by small Continental engines from 65 horse to 90 horse uh, 0200s. Um, you know, they they operate between four and a half to six gallons an hour. Um, parts are readily available. They're extremely reliable. They're basically, you know, old Briggs and Strattons. I mean, there's nothing nothing complicated. Magnetos are easy. Um, you know, there's no systems involved for the most part. You don't have hydraulic systems. You don't have electrical systems. Um, you know, so there's nothing that, that you know, nothing like troubleshooting uh, uh, intermittent electrical system. That can cost a fortune. If you don't have an electrical system, there's nothing to troubleshoot. Um, no hydraulic gears. Well, maybe, well, Ray's got a Johnson bar on his Mooney, so he doesn't even have to worry about, you know, hydraulic hydraulic gear or electric gear. The only the only hydraulics are in the brakes, you know, and a lot of these, like a Taylor Craft, will have mechanical brakes. Chief's got mechanical brakes, I believe. Um, no. So, you know, they're just, there's just not a lot to go wrong uh, to keep these airplanes in the air. What, what you do have to look at when you're purchasing these is the paperwork. And uh, as an IA, I do a lot of pre-buy inspections. And if, if, if the paperwork doesn't match the airplane, then you have an issue. And by paperwork, I mean if there's been modifications uh, to the airplane that don't fit the type certificate, they're going to have to have appropriate um, um, filings with the FA 337 forms, which are modifications or alterations uh, or STCs you know, supplemental type certificates. So those are the little bit of pitfalls with these old airplanes because a lot of them have been modified over the years. But if the paperwork's in order, you're not going to have any problems. And parts availability, they're so readily available for these old airplanes. Talk about uh, that for folks that might be unfamiliar. Yeah, especially with a Cub, you can build a Cub from scratch just from uh, PMA parts. You can get them from Univer, Dakota Cub, Wag Arrow are the three main sources. Um, and literally you can, you know, buy a PMA fuselage, you can be PMA and, and, and by PMA, that's parts manufacturing authority. These are FAA approved parts and you can build a home built with all approved parts. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not cheap, but it can be done. And every, every part on a cub, uh, can be bought. And just like somebody familiar with the classic car scene, a lot of those cars can be rebuilt with all new parts, just like these airplanes. And uh, it's Correct. pretty cool. Yeah. And and just because these airplanes are fun and affordable does not mean they're fun. And I'd love to talk to Lynn for a second. Uh, you know, you sent us a great picture, Lynn, of you uh, on a camping trip in your 172. Tell us about that trip and a couple other, you know, fun adventures you've taken in your Cessna. Well, we, we, my husband flies also. And, uh, when we go places, we take two airplanes and, uh, it, it makes for a better camping experience. So I, I really like to see how big we can do it. So the, the photo that I sent you, um, has just, uh, you know, we call it the Taj Mahal. It, uh, holds, um, cots and it's really glamping, uh, to, to camp in a 172. Although the Swift does carry some of the gear, so uh, that's helpful. But we we travel all summer. We fly across to Ohio and Indiana and um, go to Springfield where they've got a barnstorming event every year. Triple Tree's a favorite. And our uh, vintage chapter has uh, a number of, of fly-ins and fly-outs. So we're flying all summer normally. So I'll put you on the spot as well. I put Ray on the spot. So between the 172 and the Swift, they're obviously meant for two similar but different missions. What's your favorite, the venerable 172 or the, the sleek fighter-like Swift? Well, honestly, we take two planes almost all the time. So um, we'll fly together a little bit. And then when we're going to refuel, um, he'll take the Swift and go ahead. And by the time he's pushing back from the pumps, I'm um, landing in the 172. If we're camping, the 172 uh, wins hands down. But every now and then we have a long trip. Um, it is nice. Uh, we've been out, you know, to the West Coast and we did that in the Swift. 
Wow. Well, Ray, uh, you have also taken uh, some fun trips in your Chief. I believe you took it to Florida. Tell us what it's like traveling along in the Chief with 85 horse and no electrical system and <laughs> down low and slow. What's oh, that like? Well, first of all, Kyle, uh, when you stop for fuel, it's there's always somebody that appreciates the old airplane. You get to meet a lot of interesting people. And I believe me, I love flying, but it really is about the people that you meet along the way. And uh, but uh, we have flown from Marion, Indiana. We've flown our 11 AC chief uh, with 65 horsepower three times to Sun and Fun. And, uh, you know, we typically do three, three and a half hour. We have 23 gallons, 15 up front and the eight ox tank. So we'll typically do three and a half. I have done four hour um, legs, but that's a long time to sit in anything. And uh, you know, you're just you just don't get in a hurry. Eighty five mile, they're eighty five mile an hour airplanes, and uh, uh, we've just had so much fun with it. Flown it to Middletown, Ohio, many times, Oshkosh, many times. Again, Sun and Fun three times. So you mentioned they're not really a cross country airplane, but they can be. And uh, you know, we've read about people flying. Uh, Cubs and Chiefs and Luscombs uh, all over the United States. You just don't get in a hurry. Absolutely. And you have a fast airplane too. So the Mooney, I own a Mooney as well. Uh, it's a 1971 yeah. model. So it doesn't, it misses the, the vintage category by one year, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but you know, what's it like traveling to Mooney opposed to the Chief? You can get up high, you can go fast and, and it truly is a family hauler to some degree as well. Yeah, it really is. Well, it's nice. The Mooney, uh, Four place uh, airplane. If you don't take any baggage, it's nice. You can take another couple, and we often take it and uh, we'll fly, you know, over to Urbana or Indianapolis or somewhere. Uh, it's nice to take somebody, you know, for an evening meal, you know, and, and take a local flight. But for the two of us, uh, we'll get out, and uh, we've also flown it to Florida. Um, you know, five and a half to six hours downtown to Lakeland. We've done that in the Mooney, if the wind's right. Uh, it likes 5,500, 6,500 feet, the best. And uh, it has four hours. The 63 Mooney has four hours comfortable range. So um, we fly, we're strictly VFR. As I mentioned earlier, this airplane does not have autopilot, but it's just a joy to fly. But it's a different kind of flying than flying the Chief, you know, low and slow. Absolutely. And the Moonies, like you said, Ray, earlier, they're so economical. Uh, the cost of entry is not a not a huge barrier on a Mooney. They're they're relatively cheap to buy. You can find them on Barnstormers, trade a plane controller all day long for, for uh, cost-effective prices. Depending on the radios in them, uh, there's some real deals on some... Uh, uh, 63, 64, 65 Mooney M20Cs out there. Uh, for a retractable, for an airplane um, uh, with a retractable gear, there's, they're probably the most inexpensive because of the manual Johnson bar. Um, uh, a great airplane to get your complex endorsement, and, um, but they are very economical. So let's talk about that Johnson bar gear for a second. There's a lot of folks out there uh, including myself at first, who said, ah, Johnson Bar gear might be hard to operate, might take a little more muscle. Talk about operating the gear, because it's truly not that hard. And as John said earlier, they're they're easier to maintain. You have no uh, hydraulic or electrical system operating the gear. So, Ray, what's it like to operate the gear in Mooney with a Johnson Bar? Well, those of us who fly the M20C with the, the Johnson Bar, when you take off, the idea, because when people are watching, they call it the Mooney dip. And it's when you operate the Johnson bar, you know, you're trying to do the Johnson bar and hold the airplane still. So we try real hard to, uh, when we put the gear up, not to do the little dip, you know, and that's that's a fun thing to do. But it's really very easy to do when you you unlock <clears> it. It helps you bring it halfway and then you just turn your arm around and just slap it in. And uh, it's just a very easy thing to do. A little different if you're not used to it. Uh, but. The airplane uh, really flies very much like any other Mooney. The Johnson Bar is the unique thing about the M20Cs. And, and it's really not that difficult. It wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't uh, turn me away from any great Mooney on the market. 
So we're talking no. about uh, fun and affordable airplanes uh, for the viewers tonight that might have joined us a little late. I'm Kyle Ludwig on the EA staff. We have four panelists tonight with us uh, that own fun and affordable airplanes that cover the whole gamut from low and slow uh, to a little bit higher and faster. Uh, and then family haulers in between, right? I want to talk to Jacob really quick. You restored your own chief, as we talked about earlier. Um, but tell us, what was your favorite trip in the airplane? You visited some some very iconic airplanes around uh, California, where you're from. What what was your favorite trip in the Chief, Jacob? Uh, probably my favorite is a um, Oceano Airport in Pismo Beach. It's just like right on the ocean. Um, our EAA chapter, we do a fly in there once a year, and uh, we all fly in, and uh, you know we have an awesome campsite there, and we all pitch our tents and. They also, the community has a movie night there as well. So they have a big screen on one of the big hangers and, and it's just a really great time. And especially to have all, you know, every, a lot of people have vintage airplanes in my chapter suit too. So, you know, we all get together and sit around the fire and nothing like putting a tent underneath the wing of an, of an, of an airplane, um, hanging out. And then in the evening, it's beautiful to go fly over the ocean. And, um, just awesome. It's my favorite. One of my favorite things to do is just camp with these old vintage airplanes. And California is kind of unique, right? You have uh, the ocean on the coast, and then you have very mountainous areas not far away. Have you operated your chief around the mountains, Jacob? And uh, if so, how do you kind of you know uh, fend off those those risks and, and mitigate that risk with mountain flying in the chief? Yeah, I do a little bit of mountain flying. Like one of the flying we do is uh, Kern Valley. You know near like on the foothills of the Sierras. And uh, you really, it's amazing with these little airplanes with 85 horsepower, you know, they just want to fly. And I haven't had, you know, you know, even close to gross weight in a pretty warm day. You just you'd think that they would just struggle, but they, you know, you get a great positive rate on the climb and they just chug along like nothing. And I haven't had too many issues. I haven't done any off field landings with it yet, unfortunately, but landing at high altitude airports and, I haven't really found run into any issues and you know, been obviously very cautious with it because I don't really you know, want to run into things like that. But flying it up to Big Bear, you know, on a you know, density altitude about eight, nine thousand feet, plane does no problem. And it's just it's wonderful. It really gets you where you need to go. And like Gray said, moving 85 miles an hour is just a wonderful way to travel around the country and you see California. And, you know, and it's fun, too, because you got, you know, Big Bear you can go fly to and, you know, another hour in the other direction. You got Catalina Island, 26 miles over the water. And little planes are just wonderful to do that with. I, I wouldn't give it up for the world. <laughs> awesome. Great stories. And they truly are very useful airplanes. I want to go around the horn with everybody uh, as we kind of wrap up the panel discussion here. Guys, uh, you know. For the folks watching that might be interested in buying one of these airplanes, we've touched on it a little bit. But, Lynn, what is uh, one or two pieces of advice, maybe more, um, to folks that might be watching it, want to buy a 172 or a Swift like yours uh, or any of the other fun and affordable airplanes? What would you have to say to them? Well, I'll tell you, um, I've had a couple of other planes besides the 172, and when I found a good plane, you got to act on it because other people are also going to see that that, you know, aircraft is out there. So if, you know, when you obviously you need to do due diligence, but um, don't hesitate too long or have a paralysis of analysis. Um, but when you see a good plane, go for it. That is my top piece of advice. That's very sound advice. I think that, you know, all the great airplanes that pop up on Barnstormers or Trade a Plane or Controller uh, or any of the other sites out there now, uh, or, you know, I, I'm old school. I like to see the old Train of Play magazine that we all used to get, right? Um, you know, you better act on them quick. They won't last long. John, you mentioned earlier that the paperwork side is so important and, and especially looking through you know, STCs and all the parts that we've all modified airplanes with. Can you expand on that a little bit and maybe give any other advice that you have from the mechanic perspective of buying one of these yeah. airplanes? <clears throat> yeah, um, a, a good pre-buy inspection is almost um, required. Um, you know, find a mechanic that can come out, take a look at the airplane, you know, just give a look at the log books. And a good pre-buy is uh, almost like having an annual inspection done. Um, I often would say don't use the buyer's or the seller's mechanic. Get your own. 
Um, but uh, other things to look at with that is uh, age of the fabric. You know, um, you know, these airplanes were all cotton covered in the when they, they're and they're all 70 years old. So, you know, every five years or so they were recovered and everything was fixed. Now with our Dacron almost lifetime fabrics, yeah, it's not uncommon for me to see uh, 40 year old fabric jobs on airplanes that look really good. But when you pull the fabric off, you've got a myriad of uh, repairs that you have to do underneath there. So look at the age of the fabric and, you know, kind of how it's done. Are the ribs crooked or is, you know, is it, is it, if, if the workmanship looks, you know, shoddy, it's probably shoddy. Um, <laughs> the other, other things I would uh, really say is do not, especially when it comes to Cubs, do not buy an airplane on a motion. There are pretty yellow airplane. There's a lot of pretty yellow airplanes. And you call us at the Cub Club. We can probably find you one that would probably be a lot less headache than some of the ones that are out there. So, you know, and, uh, it, a lot of fun, but you have to take it seriously. And and, and the, always the elephant in the room is, uh, do you have a place to put it? So think about that when you know hangering and uh, uh where it depends a lot about where you're located in the country so uh, that's always a big a big thing that uh people don't realize until they've they've gone too far so. and john you just brought up a great point that we haven't talked about tonight and that's type clubs uh obviously i oversee the type club coalition at eaa but for everybody watching, there's pretty much a type club for every make and model of airplane out there. Some of them are mixed together. Uh, Ray, I know you're involved with one of the Aronka associations there in Middletown, Ohio. Uh, I'm a member of the Mooney Aircraft uh, uh, Owners and Pilots Association, MAPA. Uh, they're great resources uh, for you know any any aspiring aircraft owner or an aircraft owner that's looking to transition to another airplane. And then also, once you own the airplane, uh, they're great uh locations to get you know any sort of uh, parts availability training uh, programs things of that nature let's go to jacob jacob you had some advice earlier that, that kind of echoes what john was saying you know really take a look at the airplane make sure everything's squared away with it uh before you pull the trigger and make the purchase what's your advice to somebody maybe even a younger person that's out there looking for the airplane to buy definitely with what john said um it's really important to get somebody to really look over the plane um, unfortunately, when I bought mine, um, we didn't know anything about a pre-buy. I come from a family with you know, no aviation background. Um, that spread quick once I got my license. But um, it just, you know, I was I, I feel like I got pretty lucky with mine. I mean, I put 200 hours on it before we built it. But, you know, when I opened it up, I found, you know, it's the original spars that were in from the factory. And they were all cracked pretty bad. And so, like I said, it was intended to be just a, uh, a fabric covering job because it and like, you know, just like you were saying, you know, it was ratty, um, but I still didn't put as much in it as I would have if I bought a new airplane. And I, and I loved doing it because I learned so much more about my airplane than if I, you know, just hand it off to mechanic to do the work. And it was neat because I, my, my friend, he's an AMPIA and then another friend from high school, we, we all three just did it. So, I mean, the whole process I was in, in deep with it, you know, and I would say don't be afraid of it because, I mean, restoring an airplane is long and can be, you know, stressful at times, but it really is fun and it is an amazing experience and you really understand the And then you have a better love for it and, you know, you want to keep it clean and it's fun to go take it places. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, like Ray, I'm sure he understands you said he restored it twice. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I would do things a little differently, but I would definitely do it again. And I think that so many people have the same experience that you did, Jacob, you know, uh, t on two accords. First, restoring your own airplane, you definitely learn more about it and the history of it and what time vessels they really are. Uh, you know, you, you truly take uh, appreciation in that. But also, um, you know, it's an addictive thing. And so the, the fact that you bought an airplane that spread throughout your family, not surprised there and it's exciting. Um, so, so again, last but not least, Ray, what is your advice to anybody today that maybe was inspired by the story owning your Moody or your chief or, or anything else we've talked about today? What advice would you give them? Well, certainly, certainly you mentioned the type clubs. Uh, one thing, uh, owner assist annuals. If you get out there and help your mechanic and learn all you can about your airplane, it really will make it in owning that airplane a lot more enjoyable. It, it won't be such a mystery to you. 
Uh, Kyle, I just want to mention there's just a myriad of these airplanes out there. Some are sleepers. You know, we have Piper, Ronca, Porterfields, Interstate Cadets, Taylor Craft, Luscombe, uh, Air Coops. And it, within those uh, uh, brands, there's different models that are, some of them are sport pilots, some of them not. But these are airplanes that are very affordable. And what's really neat is you can, uh, you can, you can, um, you can make them original. You can restore them to original, or you can customize them, much like we do with our vintage cars. So you can put your own personality to it. Jacob, I've seen your airplane. It's a beautiful chief, and 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 what a phenomenal uh, custom job you did with that airplane. And 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 it's yours, and it, it, you have your personality with it. I think, uh, uh, you know, and uh, Kyle, we want to mention the Vintage Aircraft Association. A great place to join. There's six issues a year. It's a good place to get out and and meet people, uh, do a lot of networking, and uh, you'll learn about all these different airplanes. This affordable airplanes, you know, you can learn. You can buy one, Jacob. You learn to fly in it, and uh, and then you have something special for many years. I've owned mine since '79. That's a long time. <laughs> and as we said earlier, Ray, you know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. They're great airplanes to buy. You can learn to fly them and you can use them for so many different things afterwards, uh, whether it be the 172 uh, or, or a Chief. Uh, they're all fun. They all have different purposes. And, and I think uh, for everybody watching, just go out there and do a little bit of research, uh, find out what, what, what might work for you. Uh, you know, in closing here, does anybody have any other remarks that they'd like to make or anything they'd like to close with? Well, I would say, Kyle, um, most everybody that owns these airplanes love to talk about them and uh, are always willing to share information. So if you're interested in an airplane, find somebody that's got one similar to it, and I'm sure they'll give you a lot of free advice. <laughs> Absolutely. And to John. And it's right. Echo what Ray said. And, uh, and, and, you know, about restoring an airplane. There is no, uh, there is no voodoo about it. Um, it's uh, tedious work sometimes. It's a lot of fun, and um, uh, there's always people out there to help you. And it's a, it's a, it's a cult. I love helping people learn how to do fabric. So, uh, you know, if if you're looking for a, a, a community, uh, the vintage airplane guys are the best. Absolutely, and yeah. and. Do not be scared by watching. Do not be scared to go out to the local airport uh, to get through the fence. Don't just look through the fence. Get through the fence to the other side. Walk around the airplanes. Touch them. Learn about them, uh, especially from the people. As John said, every airplane owner, every pilot wants to talk about it. That's one of the great things about our community. Um, so, Lynn or Jacob, any closing remarks from your end? Yeah, I, I, I just like You know, to I would say... Oh, I was just going to say that um, going to a big event like um, Air Venture or Sun and Fun is another great way to be able to expose yourself to a lot of different airplanes and walk around and see a lot of them in one place. And uh, I've gotten a lot of information that way um, at, at the major events. Awesome. And Jacob? Yeah, I just, it's, I love flying these vintage aircraft. Just, you know, just the fun of flying it, but also just the amazing community that is involved with it. You know, everywhere I land, you know, someone always has, always has to come up. And, you know, one of my favorite, um, you know, times was when I was coming home from school up in uh, Utah. I had my plane up there for a while, and I landed at Flay Bob. And, you know, Ray Johnson happened to be at Flay Bob, and he saw my airplane land, and he was at my door before I could shut down and just had a wonderful <laughs> conversation. It was one, and it just, the community that just is involved with it is just unlike any other. And it's just, it's like we all know each other with, you know, before we even meet it's just because of that one connection with these aircraft. And it's, it's awesome. I love it so much. Absolutely. Well, I just want to wrap it up. Thanks guys so much for joining the panel tonight. We hope all of the viewers uh, took some insights away uh, and maybe they'll too join the fun and affordable uh, where the fun is the vintage aircraft association. Maybe they'll, uh, go to eaavintage.org and join and get the uh, six magazines a year. Take a look and, and maybe cross that yellow line at the airport and buy their own airplane. So, again, thanks to you guys uh, for being with us tonight. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks.
Okay. Absolutely. And for more content like this to all the viewers, stay tuned to eaatogether.org. If you're interested uh, in more information like what we talked about today on the panel, eaa.org or eaavintage.org uh, for more information. Thanks for watching, everybody. No matter what fast of aviation relates to you, you'll find it here at EAA through one of our three divisional memberships. Whether you fly, restore, or simply enjoy Warbird aircraft, EAA Warbird